if you want to be wealthy, you can't feel lack. You want to be a master, you can't judge your coworker. You want to be like somebody great in history, then you better execute peace in every area of your life. That's, that's the law. Welcome to the Model Health Show. This is fitness and nutrition expert Sean Stevenson, and I'm so grateful for you tuning in with me today. There's a lot going on in our world right now. We've got the ramifications of COVID-19. We've got a presidential election that's on a lot of people's minds right now. And this week, if that wasn't scary enough, we've got one of our creepiest pro-diabetes holidays going on right now. And if I'm being honest, Halloween was my favorite holiday growing up as a kid. Like, I just got to be real about it. There's something refreshing about it. There's something invigorating. Getting out and going on knocking on strangers' doors. You know, there's just something to it. And plus, I think it helps you grow in strange ways. You know, the people skills, you got to go up and, you know, you have your sales pitch. It's pretty simple. Trick or treat, you know. But some people will be like, well, you know, they ask for a joke or something, you know, who are these people? Why would you put a kid on the spot like that? But I did have a couple teed up, you know, why the chicken cross the road type vibes, you know. But, you know, not only that, it's also when you were a kid, it's that decision making skill is getting developed. You know, like, let's go to this house. Let's go to that. You like, you got to pay attention. Like, where do you think the good candy's at? We might have a limited amount of time, a little bit limited amount of space. So. All of these things, and of course, just that independence, you know, being a kid and having this feeling of freedom, you know. Now, of course, eventually I discovered that our modern day version of Halloween is really just a sugar manufacturer's wet dream, or should I say, wet nightmare. <laughs> but seriously, growing up and being oblivious to that aspect of it, it was an adventure. And now, one of the things that I really want to, to talk about, just to bring up the elephant in the room, is that the sheer amount of candy that gets distributed and consumed during this time of year is astronomical. Like it's outside of the bounds of anything that we can even believe. You know, when I was a kid and even today, of course, like the standard of care for your, your trick or treat basket your little pumpkin or your bag is like a bite size version. You know, the minis of candy bars, right? The minis, the little small bite size versions. But sometimes you go to people's house and they give you the full size. And some outlandish, you know, I guess Scrooge McDuck types, but like who are altruistic, give you the jumbo size, right? The family size of stuff. That happens every now and then. But there's also the houses that give you the wackiest candies. They give you the little dumb dumb suckers, right? The dumb dumbs. Listen to the name, dumb dumb. And so they give you those. Maybe throw you a couple of you know Hershey Kiss. What about candy corn? <laughs> Why does that exist? Like what? Who is just like you know what? It's Halloween. I can't wait to have candy corn. Why is that still around? Why is it still a thing? But anyway, so they'll throw some candy corn in your back. We've got different regulations now. People want their stuff prepackaged, you know, but those are things that we would get. There was one time I remember there was a, a lady who you go to her house and you, you know, you knock on her door, ring the doorbell, trick or treat, and she would get she would bring out a a bowl of pennies with a spoon. And basically you take your helping of pennies, like with your spoon, you get one big helping of pennies to throw into your bag. I swear to God, it's a real thing. You know, she's the penny lady, right? The penny lady. And there's a couple of dimensions to that. Number one, where did she get those pennies? All right. To this day, I got to know how this woman got all those pennies because they look like she collected them over time. You know what I mean? And just the giving the kid the responsibility of, of lugging around a hefty amount of pennies in their bag. We're already like, you know, 
tiny ourselves, you know, but now we got to do, we got to lift some weights along with our candy. You know, I think maybe she was trying to look out for us low key, you know, share the, the love, give us some responsibility. I don't know, but it was always an adventure. But all of that, that was the ghost of Halloween past. All right. Things are way different today. Right now, we're in the midst of the intrusion of COVID-19. We're in the midst of a lot of civil conflict and we're in the midst of a lot of uncertainty. And that's playing out in how we interact with each other. And it's also playing out in the way that we relate to ourselves, our capacity for change and opportunities and our ability to succeed and to find happiness. It's very difficult. It's, it's a lot more challenging amidst so much uncertainty. And what I really wanted to articulate today, and this is a very special episode, is to articulate to you that none of the conditions today can hold dominion over your life unless you allow them to. All right, and we say that again, none of the conditions today can hold dominion over your life unless you allow them to. You still have so much potential for growth, for happiness, for success, for achievement, for impact, for love. All of those things are still available. They're still here. They're present. The accessibility is there, but where is our attention? And so I want to put this together and to provide to you today seven scary good, scary good messages to remind you of how powerful you are to affect change in your life. It doesn't matter truly, and I want you to understand this, this is real. It doesn't matter which political candidate is in office. It doesn't matter what's going on with the economics of the land right now. It doesn't matter what's going on with the health construct. You still have power to affect change in your own life. And even in the world at large, you are that powerful, truly. Because people, probably half the country is gonna be upset that this person is in office. Half of the country is gonna be happy about it. But in truth, we determine the destiny of our own lives. Of course, there are grander ramifications of those things, but regardless of the political candidate, it's up to us as the people. It's up to us. It's up to you and me to change and to affect change the way that we want in the world. We can't just pass this off to, you know, four more years of whatever it is or four years of this and that. It's not about that. It's about what we do on a day-to-day -day basis and understanding that truly from this day forward, we can, as a community, cultivate more happiness, success, altruism in our own lives and our families, start to raise up our children to be better people so that we're no longer deciding between the lesser of evils and instead starting to decide from the greater of goods. We have the opportunity to do that right now, but we have to be reminded it's okay, all of us, the greats, the most successful of all time, the people that we write the stories about, they're good at remembering, but all of us can use a reminder of how powerful we are. So really excited about this episode and to bring these messages to you because truly this is the first time this year in 2020, you know, I've been just so just focused, dedicated on this mission for the past. It's been almost 20 years, 19 years in the field of health and wellness that I didn't really realize until this year, until, until thanks to 2020 for giving me the opportunity to see this and to truly understand where I'm coming from, you just don't see this level of impact. You don't see this level of success. I'm the first person in my family to graduate from college. I'm the first person in my family to be able to overcome the tremendous amount of obstacles and achieve just a level of health and sovereignty within my own body. Everybody around me, every single family member was battling with a chronic health issue. I grew up in that. I was a part of it. I had chronic health issues myself. Chronic asthma, I'm hospitalized every year, which was actually low key fun because, you know, they had a Nintendo there, so I didn't mind. But, you know, I had the inhalers. So I see, the, you know, the movies where the person, you know, they, they got the inhaler. You know, it might be a James Bond villain. You know, he's super, like, cutthroat, but then he's, 
he's got that boy, I was that, right? I was hardcore, but hit that, you know? So that experience, having an arthritic condition in my spine, I had no idea how much power I had to affect change in my own life and most importantly for this message to affect change in the world around me. And it wasn't until 2020 that I truly like, I was able to sit with it and to understand, you know, all the clinical work, all the miles, all the travel, all the speaking events, all the hours and research, you know, just in the past 12 months alone, I've read over a thousand peer reviewed studies. And these studies are not like tasty, delicious, romantic reads. You know, a lot of this stuff is just arduous, you know, your eyes sweating, you know, just going through a lot of, you know, a lot of data where folks who are in a certain paradigm are writing in this kind of scholarly fashion to look smart, you know, and taking that and, and making that into something that is approachable and understandable for everyday folks who really need the information because what's coming forward right now and one of these important truths is that when you have very sound peer-reviewed evidence that can transform the entire healthcare system and it might be based on a particular food or, or, or way of eating, it takes on average about 17 years from it, go, from it to go from study and proven effectiveness to actually being employed and taught in clinical practice. We don't have that kind of time. In the words of the poet Sweet Brown, ain't nobody got time for that. We need it now. We can have access now. We don't have to wait. And so what I truly understood this year was my ability, as we all have, but I understood it for the first time, my ability to change the world. We, each and every one of us, has the ability to literally change the entire world. That's the power of an idea. And I got that truly because in 2016, I had the audacity to publish a book. And what I had to go through just to get that book out, when it was a niche idea, it was something that was kind of, you know, if you're in the know, you might talk about it, but it's very cookie cutter around it. Like you need to sleep, you need to get eight hours of sleep. But I created something because of what I saw, this gap in health information, right? Being a nutritionist and seeing folks on incredible nutrition protocols and, and, and movement protocols, but if they're not sleeping well, they were not getting the results. And so I felt it was in integrity that I have to talk about this. I have to figure it out for the people I was working with. And then once I saw the results of folks struggling for years with their blood sugar and their own metformin, and finally their blood sugar is normalized, naturally somebody's been struggling with their weight for years sometimes decades and finally when we get their nutrition dialed in their moving practices and their sleep and once we got their sleep dialed in finally the weight start to come off i had to share this information and so to get that on bookstore shelves this niche idea by me having the audacity to do that to put the time and energy into creating that and getting out and spreading the word about it, but in a way that makes sense, that, that takes something, this kind of niche idea, a sleep. Sleep, it sounds boring until it comes from the lips of somebody who's passionate about it, until it comes from the lips of somebody who's seen it firsthand impact the lives of countless people. And when it comes from the lips of somebody who can make it approachable and understandable for, for the average person to just to be like, oh, that sounds like I want that. I'm trying to make sweet love to sleep too, right? Making it attractive, right? Because the science exists. I was shocked. I was absolutely shocked at the level of data that existed that nobody knew about. The fact that there's more, 400 times more melatonin in the gut, in the human gut. And in the pineal gland, when I went to college, I was taught that melatonin is produced in the pineal gland. End of story. The end. That was it. Chapter one, melatonin is produced in the pineal gland. The end. Whoa, no, 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 no. 400 times more melatonin in your gut. This brings to the paradigm 
how much food matters, the health of our gut. And that's just one chapter. There's 21 clinically proven strategies in this book. And it changed the world. That book has now been read by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. It's translated into 20 different languages. It's in bookstores and libraries all over the world because I said, yes, it's the power of an idea. I changed the world. We all can do that. We all have that power. Where I come from, if you saw it on paper, I would not be the person that's capable of doing that. But I did it. And I want to remind you of how powerful you are to affect change in your own life and the entire world. We need that right now. We need you right now. And taking that a step further, you know, like I said, I'm a nutritionist. I'm, my passion is food. That was the bridge for me to get from that place of disease, from, from that place of disorder to a level of health and wellness and happiness and being able to pay it forward and to serve and to impact the lives of millions and millions of people. Food was my bridge because food isn't just food, it's information. And it truly does, ch it changes you from the inside out. Whether it's low quality food or the best stuff possible, we get to decide. But most people have no idea that it's an option. And so I made it a mandate that this was the time right now to put that into book form because there's a virility to books. There is a shareability and a power to books that is still unmatched. And so my new book, Eat Smarter, is coming out very, very soon. And I've been working the past two years on it. And it's so funny how it's coming out right now when we need it most. There's a powerful statement that there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And this is the idea that needs to be brought forward because we're taking people finally for the first time. I know all the guys. I know the guys who work in the field of nutrition, the integrative medicine, the physicians, the nutrition. I know, I know them. But never before in book form has somebody taken people behind the scenes and showed them exactly how their metabolism works. All the different enzymes involved and hormones involved the mitochondria involved, how does it all work to actually burn fat? Like, how does a process work? What are the nutrients that actually are essential in making the process happen? What are the things that create clogs, hormonal clogs in the process? We all deserve to know these things. And this is the first time in book form that is being brought to the world. And that's just one section of the book. One of the most powerful sections of the book is how specific foods and nutrients impact our cognitive performance, our ability to literally create memories. There are certain foods and nutrients that make that process happen. Everybody should be able to know this stuff. And to take it a step further, when we're talking about our cognitive function, one of our greatest issues today, one of the greatest issues of our time is our inability to communicate and to connect with other people. There's such disarray, there's such infighting. And what I put, I, this was one of the most challenging things for me to do and also one of the most rewarding things because the data exists demonstrating how certain nutrients and nutrient deficiencies literally disrupt our ability to have empathy and patience, compassion, the ability to communicate and there are certain deficiencies that even affect our levels of violence. And that's all in there. But most importantly, what we can do about it. What we can do about it. Because it's not just about individual choice. Today, we're talking about what we are capable of doing. But it's also us working to help to rearrange and transform the systems in which we operate. Because we need both for massive scale change, which is what is possible right now. This is what 2020 is offering us right now. So I want you, if you've gotten any value from the Model Health Show, this is the thing that I want to ask you to do. I don't ask for much. I'm asking you now to go to eatsmarterbook.com and pre-order your copy right now. Pause this and come back to me. Go to eatsmarterbook.com 
and pre-order the book. And you're also going to get access, immediate access to a special mini course that I put together. It's a $97 mini course. And this is focused on the 10 foods, 10 of the most clinically proven foods that help to optimize your fat loss hormones. All right, so the hormones that are actually engaged in the process of burning fat, these 10 foods are clinically proven to aid in that process. All right, there's no food that's a magic bullet, but you'll understand in a much deeper and really wonderful way how these foods can aid in that process. And also, what are the best ways to get these foods in on a daily basis? So you get access to that mini course immediately. You pre-order the book, go to eatsmarterbook.com. I need you to do this right now. And I'm going to tell you why. This book is going to be everywhere. It's going to be in Target stores. It's going to be in bookstores across the country. Access everywhere on the internet. But to be, to have a big idea, transformative book like this in Target? In America's pastime? In Target stores? It's incredible. And we're also working on Walmart as well. But that, our ability to get into these places and even more, places outside of our paradigm that we're not even thinking about yet is based on the number of pre-orders right now so we can really hit it hard when the book comes out. So please go and do that right now. Go to eatsmarterbook.com and make sure that Eat Smarter is everywhere. And I promise you this book is going to be an absolute game changer for you. It is powerful on so many levels, but what it's really doing is connecting us to food in new and dynamic ways that always existed but nobody has talked about it before. So I really appreciate that. And again, this is just leaning into the power of an idea. We all have this capacity to affect change in our lives and to affect change in the world at large. And today's episode is about reminding you of that. We've got seven scary good messages to remind you of your power to affect change. And first up, we've got a message from one of my all-time favorite episodes, one of my all-time favorite people. He's been a a great mentor in my life. And he's a best-selling author, creator of The Life Visioning Process, one of my all-time favorite audio books and programs. I listened to maybe, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, whenever it came out. And I was just, it, was, it had such an impact on me. But then he ended up becoming somebody, a friend in my life. And the, even how it all happened is nuts. You know, but this is how... Again, it's also environment and what you surround yourself with. We tend to attract, you know, we tend to find ourselves in the presence of those things, you know. So again, it's a really good friend of mine, best-selling author and the founder of Agape Spiritual Center here in Los Angeles. Uh, just an incredible speaker. Oh my goodness, one of the best speakers on the planet. And his name is Dr. Michael Beckwith. And in this message he has for you, He's showing you and reminding you why right now is, yes, it's a time of great turbulence, but it's also a time of great opportunity for change. But that change is up to us. So let's jump into this message from the one and only Dr. Michael Beckwith. There are so many levels to what's happening, you know, from the, the very practical uh, fear that's gripped people's minds, that's, cre you know, that's the virus of the mind, first of all, is fear. And fear uh, diminishes your perspective, uh, blocks your perception, inhibits wisdom, guidance, and direction. So the world has taken a nightmare pill where they're living in uh, the vibration of a worst case scenario and all the things that come with that. Um, from the higher perspective, we're in a deep cleansing. You know, the, 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 the earth itself is vibrating at a much higher octave. The earth is alive. You know, when you look at it from the, the shamanic, mystical uh, vibration uh, domain, the earth is alive and it's vibrating high, which means that everything at a lower frequency is being cleansed out. From the scientific point of view, they can measure the vibration of the earth and it's definitely increased over the last 30 years. So from the science and from the mystical, a shamanic, you know, frequency has raised which means that we're in a great clearing right now. You can see when you look out on the world events, things that would have taken years for us to discover, we now find out the next day. Like politicians would tell a lie. You wouldn't know that for five years. 
They got away with it. Today, you can see them lying right in front of you. You know they're telling a lie. You know, so things are much more transparent. So right now we're in a, in a, in a situation where you're looking at the death of an old paradigm and the birth of the new. But the old paradigm is very loud and trying to hold on. And the new, you have little buds of the new springing up, but they're not as loud as the old. And so I, I always like to say that those who are waking up and are embracing a higher order of being, love, compassion, generosity, service, you know, there's no superiority or, or, or inferiority around humanity. We're all sourced from the same, same source. People who are, who are awakening to that, I like to say that we are the reporters of the new paradigm that's yet to be. And the other individuals are reporters of the status quo and that which is dying. So when you turn on the news and you look at the reporters telling you something, they're actually reporting from a status quo and old paradigm. And it inundates people's minds. People actually believe what they're looking at, even though they forget that we live in the most censored, one of the most censored countries in the world. And you're only going to get what powers that be want you to see. So when you ask what's going on, this, there's, a, there's a lot of flux, a lot of turbulence. Everything is up. Racism, white superiority, uh, hate, you know, all of that. You know, so we have to thank 45 for allowing that to be more transparent. You know, uh, he accidentally opened up, the, opened up the curtain to see what has been, what we've known have been fomenting for years. We know about, about, about racism. We know about um, the hatred of the color of our skin. We know about it. But he's opened up the window so everybody is seeing it, saying, wow, this is still going on. This is real. So what looks bad, and it is terrible, death, mayhem, police brutality, uh, politicizing of a, of a COVID-19, you know, making a political football rather than dealing with some serious science behind it. It's all a part of an old paradigm trying to hold on, you know. And, and the first thing that has to happen is individuals have to know how to handle fear. They have to know how to navigate with that. They have to know how to mm, not allow it to run them. Sometimes what I ask people to do is to take out a newspaper, read it from front to back, put it away, and then pick it up six months later and read it. And you'll see all the things you would, that was the top headlines and everybody was concerned about this. And, you know, it's generally faded and something else is taking its place. And what has taken its place is another fear-based way of looking at life. So we have to understand that these things do pass. Now, the way that you're describing this is there's the universal perspective, millions of galaxies, multidimensional universes, the cosmos always expanding, um, the eternal presence that we're living in. That's timeless. And then there's time. And so our role is to bring the timeless into time, meaning creativity, innovativeness, resourcefulness, um, poetry, uh, generosity, That's, those are timeless. It means you've gone to a space outside of time and you've brought something into time. That's what a soulful artist does. They bring something into time. So most people lose their perspective and they live primarily from fight or flight. You know, uh, they're trying to save their life. They're into, and they're, they're into the survival frequency. They lose their perspective of the cosmos, of their connect, connection to the timeless. So this is what spiritual practice is all about. It's not about uh, magical thinking or wishing that something wasn't happening or burying your head in the ground and pretending that a bad thing did not happen. It is about understanding that <clears throat> in this universal perspective, there aren't any problems. There aren't, there are only ideas and solutions and spiritual prototypes. And we have to go there and get them and bring them here. You know, this is a solution for everything. There, can, there cannot be a problem and not be a solution. That's an impossibility, you know, but you don't get to the solution from fear or being, being, being time blinded. The solution comes from your expanded awareness. All right, I hope you enjoyed that message from Dr. Michael Beckwith. 
Up next, we've got one of my favorite people on the planet. I'm so grateful that he is alive and doing his thing right now at this time in human history. He's one of the most uh, talented, brilliant, and also funny people that I know. And he's created so many viral videos with his special blend of comedy with a, with a poignant message as well tied into it. And it's from none other than J.P. Sears. And in this particular message, he's going to be talking about the powerful reminder that we need right now about the social constructs that we're all inundated with right now that are designed at their very core to keep us in fear. And while these entities keep you in fear, this is important, while they keep you in fear, they're simultaneously distracting you from your greatness. You can't have the focus on two things at the same time. You're either focused on your greatness and what can be done, or you're focused and inundated by the fear, which has this crippling effect on our ability to create change. Not that fear is not valuable. We're all going to experience fear. But when we become indoctrinated with fear and inundated with fear, that's when we go into a dangerous land. So check out this message from JP and use this as an encouragement to take back control of your mind because this is the time to do it. So let's hear what JP has to say. At the heart of it all, in my heart, I am such a fan of humanity. Like, I love people. Like, I love people who disagree with me. I love people who agree. I love everything in between. I love people. So I, I'm a fan of Team Human. Now, I think what it, uh, unfortunately works against Team Human, and it's always self-inflicted, is when we live in fear. And that that video what it's like to believe everything the media tells you. My intention behind it was to help liberate people from their fear. And if a fish doesn't know it's swimming in water, we got to wake it up to realize it's in water and let alone what kind of water it's in. And you know, the late great Ram Dass once said, you can't get out of a jail you don't know you're in. And, and we're, with what the media tells us, and I'm not here tinfoil hat conspiracy, like, ah, they're out to get you. I'm here to call a spade a spade and, and suggest that the mainstream media, it's fear-mongering. And it's, it's a business model. It's, it's not far-fetched, in my opinion, you know, that the headlines, be they spoken or written online in print on your TV, the headlines are meant to evoke a fear response inside of your psyche. And that gets your attention because, and that's survival reasons. If you're out in the wild, if something is scary, like the bushes move in an like uh, abnormal way, that gets your attention. It's human instinct. We want to focus on what scares us so that we can discertain how to protect ourselves from that scary thing, fight, flight, freeze, whatever the heck it's going to be. And, and thus the media gets our attention with the scary headlines and like, Hey, by the way, it's been three minutes. Here's the latest death count. Well, okay. Now 30 seconds later, here's the updated death, death count. By the way, it's scrolling on the bottom of the screen. So that's coming at us not only 24 seven, but 24 seven, from 360 degrees of angles. How good of a life are we going to live if we're in constant fear that's not in our best interest? Now, I think it, I'm going to, I'm going to get off my soapbox in a second here, but not yet. I think fear is such a healthy emotion when it serves us. If, if I hear a crash through my window, cool. Like, I'm going to be afraid, like, what's going on? It's going to help alert me to a, a situation that is meaningful and beneficial for me to deal with. But when we are constantly being inundated with fear because we plug into the source of fear, we're glued to the headlines and getting our news from the news, which I like into, like, that's like getting financial advice from broke people. Then we're we're... we're we're always being indoctrinated with fear that's not 
actually giving us helpful, meaningful information about how we can live a, a better life for ourselves. So with that video and, and probably dozens of videos I've made in the past six months, the intention is to help people realize the jail that they don't know they're in, the, the jail of fear. And, and given that fear is a human emotion, and, and I think a beneficial human emotion when it's a, a fear that serves us, it's, it's one thing to be afraid. It's another thing to view life through the lens of fear and make decisions from the place of fear. Because we know, like in the old examples of, you know, someone yelling fire in an old movie theater, the panic kills more people than the actual fire does. So uh, I think it's very human of us to be afraid, yet it is perhaps disempowering of us to make decisions from the fear and view our lives and everything else exclusively through the lens of fear. All right, that was the wonderful and talented JP Sears. And as a reminder, it's one thing to be informed with all of the access to news and media we have. It's one thing to be informed. It's another thing to be imprisoned. It's another thing to be inundated by it. And so just becoming aware, what is this doing to me? What, what effect is it having on me and my ability to, to perform and to make change and to see the good? Because I promise you, there is so much good going on right now. There's so much good that we have access to. Yes, we have problems. Yes, we have things that need some change, but we have to do that from a place of a new vision. We have to do that from a place of empowerment. And so just keeping these little reminders uh, in our spirit and also a reminder of what lens are you going to choose to see life through from today forward? Are you going to see life through the lens of overriding fear or are you going to decide to see life through the, the lens of possibility, of empowerment? We get to decide. Next up, we've got an incredible message from just somebody super talented. Uh, she's a master coach, best-selling author, a wonderful speaker, and her name is Christine Hassler. And this is one of our most popular episodes. It really struck a chord with a lot of people. So many valuable insights into the inner workings of our mind and how we relate to ourselves and thus also relating to other people. And in this clip, we're going to listen to what Christine has to share about what an expectation hangover is and how it's likely playing a role in our lives today. So I made up the term, um, which is probably good we're defining it. It's when one of three things happen, either something doesn't go according to plan and you're disappointed, like you didn't get the job, um, you end up getting a divorce, whatever, someone breaks up with you. Yeah. Or something does go according to plan, but you don't feel like you thought you would. Mm -hmm. Like my job in Hollywood, reaching a certain point and not being happy. Yeah. Or life just throws you an unexpected curveball. You know, you get diagnosed with an illness, you get laid off. Like something undesirable that you didn't see coming that throws off your sense of certainty, safety, and control, just like a universal two by four. And you're left with like hangover like symptoms like you you want to get out of it it feels awful your head is spinning from all the the thoughts and the thinking and the fear of uncertainty it's just a terrible terrible feeling because the thing about an expectation hangover is we don't have certainty and a well of emotion comes up and we're in chaos because anytime we have an expectation hangover there's some kind of transition happening there's some kind of ending there's some kind of blow to our ego or a sense of of security and we're in that uncertain period, which for the human psyche is incredibly challenging. It's even more challenging if you grew up in a more kind of chaotic, unstable household because it threatens that, that little kid inside who's like, when's the other shoe going to drop? Oh, my God. And when we're in those, what, we, what most people tend to do is want to get out of them as quickly as possible. And they use ineffective coping strategies like numbing. Mm -hmm. Overeating, over drinking, over gaming, over social media, over working. Working is one of the yeah. kind of acceptable ones. Right. Yeah. Um, spiritual bypass, like I'm just going to meditate my way out of it and like everything happens for a reason and la di da. Or be strong. I'm going to be strong. Be strong. I'm going to push through and look at how strong I am. That's another one that doesn't work. Or the, the pep talk, <laughs> just that right. positive pep talk kind of thing. Yeah. And 
those kind of get you a little bit through it, but it's like putting a Band-Aid on a broken arm. It doesn't really heal it. Right. And that's really why I wrote the book, is because from my own life and working with thousands of people at this point, there's such healing that can happen in an expectation hangover because let's just use like if you got broken up with, it's not the first time your heart's been broken. Like it's pushing a button that goes back to maybe when your dad left the family when you were five or something like that. And it's in those moments where we can really dive in and go into the feelings and heal emotionally, mentally, behavioral, and spiritually. And so to me, disappointment is a huge doorway to transformation. If we can, again, start with acceptance. Like, I don't like this, I don't like this, but ask not why is it happening, but what am I learning? Mm. What is it showing me? That is such a powerful message. And we are definitely, many of us are experiencing situations that we don't like. That is for certain, but that's okay. Because she's also alluding to what's possibly the most powerful means of moving past these expectation hangovers, which is by investigating the things within our own hearts and within our own minds. And the number one tool to do that is by asking the right questions. And next up, we've got accelerated learning expert, brain and memory expert, Jim Quick, to tell you more about that. Check it out. say start with the right questions because we have anywhere from 50 to 70,000 thoughts a day and a lot of those thoughts come in the form of questions in fact in the chapter I do on how to advance your thinking and solve problems and be a better decision maker which I think is like the gem of like the book that chapter alone I feel like it's worth the value of the book because our life is the sum total of all the questions we've asked to this point Right, And uh, I have a quote in there from a French philosopher that uh, says that life is the C between the B and the D. Life is the C between the B and the D. And you're thinking, Jim, you're speaking in tongues, you're speaking in code. You know, what's the B? What's the D? I don't get this. Let me, let me give you a hint. The B is birth. So what's the D? Death. Death. And C, which is life, C stands for choice. You know, we right now, our life is a sum total of the choices and decisions we've made up to this point. And part of our decision-making process is, uh, is at, on default. Remember that technology is the digital default. We want some, it done for us, and we haven't developed these thinking skills. But thinking, when you think about it, and I go through various models on how to make good decisions and how to solve problems and how to be a better thinker, because I think school teaches you what to think, but not how to think. They teach you what to learn, but not how to learn. And so when you think about what thinking is, thinking is this process of asking and answering questions inside our own mind. Right. And if you're asking yourself, you know, is that true? Notice you had to ask a question to think about it, right? So that's positive proof. So a lot of these 50, 60, 70,000 thoughts a day are questions. And I believe that there are some questions you ask more than others. They're dominant questions. Maybe you have one, two, or three that you ask consciously and unconsciously throughout the day. And the reason why it's important is, we've talked about this, is your brain is primarily a deletion device. Let me say that again. Your brain is primarily a deletion device. It's trying to keep information out because if it paid attention to everything, you, you would go insane. right? There's a billion stimuli we could be paying attention to. So what gets through that filter the things that we care about, the things we're interested in, and things we ask questions about, because we have part of our brain, and we do a whole thing on brain anatomy in the book, because you know we, I want you to know how limitless your 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 superpowers really are, and um, and part of your brain called a reticular activating system, RAS, simple to to remember, it really determines what you're going to focus on, and it gets activated by your questions, and so as an example. I remember years ago, my sister would send me pictures and photographs, emails with this specific kind of breed of dog. It's a pug dog. Um, they have a pug dog in Men in Black. It's like 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 a like smushy face, and you could dress them up like ballerinas. They're very compliant, right? But I didn't know. My question was like, why is she sending me all these pictures of pugs? And then I realized that her birthday was coming up. 
So she's mm, a great marketer. Dropping those hints. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, so she was seeding all those, but I started asking a question about these pugs, and then guess what? I started seeing pugs everywhere. Mm. You know, I'd go to the the grocery store, the health food store, and I would be checking out, and somebody's in front of me is holding a pug dog, checking out. I'd be jogging in my neighborhood, and I I swear to you, I saw a guy walking six pug dogs. And my question for everyone who's listening is, did the pug dogs just magically appear one day? No, of course not. They were always there, but they were not important to me because I wasn't asking the questions. They were part of that billion stimuli I was trying to keep out of my mind that I wasn't paying attention to. Now, here's the thing. What are your questions? What are the questions you're asking all the time that are bringing certain things into your life? You know, And it's like an algorithm. I, I talk about it in the book where it's like it's, you're programming yourself. It's like when you're going through Instagram or Facebook, everything you like and share. Have you ever noticed like you start like looking, you know, liking a lot of cat videos or whatever, they start feeding you more cat videos, right? But our brains are the same way. If we start looking at... You know, it's it's a, you know sometimes it's a scary time. We live in some in very you know turbulent times, and if you're just if the, if the media is hijacking your your amygdala to focus on fear, and you start looking at it all the time, your brain you just start looking for threats everywhere, and that's all you see, and you delete all all everything you'd be grateful for. You delete every all the opportunity. You delete you know all the magic also in life. I'm not saying don't focus on things that could be threatening at all. But I'm saying, what are you asking questions about that dictate your focus? And so this dominant question, as an example, um, and we'll get to Will Smith as an example in a moment, is uh, one of the ways of finding your dominant question is just to just listen to your own voice. You know, another way is like journaling or meditating because you see certain themes that come up constantly. And I think self-awareness, that really it's a superpower. This book is a book on self-awareness. It's an owner's manual for your mind and how to be conscious and mindful and put intent in your mindset, put intent in your motivation, put intent in the methods that you're using day to day. And um, so I took my friend through a process and we found out her dominant question that she asks all the time is, how do I get people to like me? How do I get people to like me? Now, everyone listening, you don't know her age, you don't know her background, you don't know her job, you don't know what she looks like, her ethnicity, you don't know anything about her, but you know a lot about her. Mm -hmm. Like if somebody is obsessed with asking the question, how do I get people to like me, what's her life, what, what's her personality like? It's going to be one that tries to cater to everybody else. Yeah. Exactly, exactly that. It, it, you become a that person is, is going to be a sycophant, right? They're going to be people pleasing all the time. They're going to be martyring themselves. People are going to take advantage of them. Their personality is always going to change depending on who they're spending time with, because they're going to, you know, talk about the same kind of interests and and, and have the same kind of values, right? They have low self esteem, and you know all that, and you only know one question she asks herself. That's it. And my question for everybody listening is, what's your dominant question? What's the question you're thinking about all the time that's keeping you maybe limited, right? And how can you upgrade those questions to be more limitless? Let me give you an example. Um, when you mentioned Will Smith, I, I help actors to speed read scripts, memorize their lines, uh, focus better. We've talked about my X-Men story you know, in, a pre in a previous episode with you. With Will Smith, he... Um, I was spending the entire day with him in Toronto, and he was shooting from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. So Which movie was it? So this was uh, Suicide Squad. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it was winter time, and it was very cold out. But we found out his his dominant question before we went to go shoot was is how do I make this moment even more magical? Actually, before it was how do I make this moment magical, and then we we played with it like how can we make that even more even enhance that? Well. Let's make it even more magical because it presumes it's already magical, yeah. right? And I was like, "Wow, that, that's a powerful question." And and later that night, shooting, and everyone thinks that Hollywood is very glamorous, but you know this. It's just it's a grind. Yeah, it is. It's just waiting all the time and just like wait, you know, hurry up to just wait, right around. And we're on set, and it's a night shoot, and you know, it's 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 tough. I, you know, it's like two o'clock in the morning. His family from West Philly, you we all know the song, is is there, and we're outside, and 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 they're not shooting. And I, I asked him, I was like, "How do you get ready? Like, you're just we're, we're waiting here for hours for you to go on camera, and when, you know, for the director to bring you back on. How do you get ready?" He was like, "Jim, 
I don't have to get ready. I stay ready. I'm like, whoa, it's whoa. good to be Will Smith, right? He's about determination. He does the work. Because I believe the life you live are the lessons you teach. The life you live are the lessons you teach others. It's not what you say. It's what you show, right? It's not what you promise. It's what you prove to other people. And so uh, it was interesting because we're all cold out there watching these little monitors of what they're filming. And, uh, and he starts to bring people uh, blankets. And he starts to make hot chocolate for everybody and bring it to us. And he starts cracking jokes and telling stories. He was living his dominant question of how do I make this moment even more magical? I mean, it, it, it was beautiful. And so my, my thing for everybody here is be conscious of your thoughts because thoughts are things and what you ask for, you will receive. All right, that was accelerated learning expert, memory expert, speed reading phenom. And my really good friend, I've known about 10 years now, Jim Quick. He's had such a powerful impact on my life, so many different dimensions. Uh, I really love that guy. And he's just really bringing forward the importance of utilizing the most powerful entity in the known universe, which is the human mind. We all have one. That's the thing about it. We all have one. It has infinite capacity to create, to figure out problems, to create success, to create sadness, to create despair, to create beauty. We all have it within us but we've never been given an owner's manual. We've never been taught how to use it. And one of the fundamental programming tools is the power to ask questions because the human mind has this really powerful phenomenon that takes place when you ask it a question. It's called instinctive elaboration. When you pose your mind a question, it has no choice. You are, it is hardwired to seek out answers to the questions you ask it. So what are the quality of your questions? All right, so again, love that message. And I want you to ask yourself and think about it. What questions are you asking right now? What questions are on repeat in your mind right now? Like, why is this happening? Why me? Why don't people get it? Or is it, what is this trying to teach me? What is the situation trying to teach me? What gift is in all of this? What qualities are wanting to emerge in my life as a result of the changes from COVID-19? Right, start to ask empowering questions, and I promise you, you will find the gifts within it. You'll find the gold amidst all of the, all of the fool's gold, all right? Because both exist. So when talking about memory, when talking about accelerated learning, our nutrition matters as well. And there's one company that has two double-blind Placebo controlled clinical trials, and this was conducted by the Boston Center for Memory, showed that folks who utilize Alpha Brain from on it showed improvements in memory and brainwave patterns that are directly connected to enhanced focus versus a placebo. So, folks utilizing Alpha Brain literally had improvements in memory and focus it changed the brain waves now here's the thing about alpha brain versus you know nootropics are a growing category of supplements right now on it utilizes earth grown nutrients there's nothing synthetic there's nothing fishy or abnormal these are from all from natural sources all right all earth grown nutrients are combined in this formula and i want you to pop over and check it out have a look at what the ingredients are have a look at the studies Man, I'm telling you, there are so many folks that really swear by Alpha Brain for their performance, whether they're, you know, going to do a podcast or do a, do a talk or perform at their job, whatever the case, comedy, doing a comedy set. Alpha Brain is that deal for so many people right now. Millions of folks have already utilized Alpha Brain. So pop over there, check it out. They also found in one of the studies, it also had improvements in verbal learning memory. So the ability to listen and to pick up the data and remember more of it. So even as you're listening to me right now, being able to retain more of that information, really interesting stuff. Pop over there, check them out. It's onit.com forward slash model. You get 10% off. That's O-N-N-I-T.com forward slash model. You get 10% off the alpha brain and everything else that Onit carries. Exclusive with the Model Health Show. You get 10% off everything, even the fitness equipment. So pop over there, check it out. And also keep in mind, I cannot 
not talk about this when we're talking about the nutrition side because working in my clinical practice we get people dialed in on the very best nutrition you know designed specifically for their unique metabolism unique needs but the nutrition no matter how good it is will only go so far if you're not abiding by the other principles of the body the other things that your genes expect of you to have a positive outpicturing or epigenetic influence and one of those things, it doesn't matter what kind of supplements you're hammering, if you're not sleeping well, you are never going to perform at your best level, period. This is arguably the most powerful thing for helping to regulate our hormone function, for example. All of our hormones and neurotransmitters related to weight loss, cognitive performance. Our nutrition also heavily impacts our sleep quality, by the way, but our sleep quality has a massive impact on the nutrition that we bring in and how it affects our bodies. And so with that said, we want to make sure that we're supporting our sleep right now more than ever. The CDC has reported that sleep deprivation is an epidemic. And they noted that approximately 115 million Americans are regularly sleep deprived. 115 million Americans are regularly sleep deprived. How do you think that's affecting our ability to communicate? How do you think that's affecting our ability to perform well in our careers and in our family? How do you think that's affecting us? So many of us are walking around like this is our normal is being sleep deprived. We could do something about this. Of course, there's many lifestyle factors, but there's certain things in our nutrition we can do to give us that extra 5%, 10% benefit. And one of those things is highlighted in a study published in the journal Pharmacology, Biochemistry, and Behavior. Now, this is a journal that's really geared towards pharmacology. All right? This is what they want to highlight. But this was so remarkable, something that is natural, that's been utilized for thousands of years, that is published in this prestigious peer-reviewed journal. And what the researchers found was that the renowned medicinal mushroom Rishi, Ganoderma, Rishi was found to significantly decrease sleep latency, meaning it helped test subjects to fall asleep faster. Rishi was also found to help to increase your overall sleep time because there's a difference between just being unconscious and actually being asleep and going through your sleep cycles efficiently. So it was found to help with that and also was found to increase non-REM deep sleep. So this is that anabolic sleep and REM sleep as well. Right, so there's something really special about it. It's again, to be published in a peer-reviewed journal that's geared towards pharmacology, Rishi, you did that. You did that. So I get my Rishi. It's dual extracted. So this means it's a hot water extract and alcohol extract. So you get all of the benefits, the beta-glucans, the triterpenes, all the cool things that are found in Rishi that you don't get if you don't do both extraction methods. Four Sigmatic does both in a simple, easy to do little packets. I've been using them for years. One of my favorite nighttime routines, have a cup of Rishi tea. So pop over there, check them out. It's foursigmatic.com forward slash model. You get 15% off everything they carry. Even more, they've got a new kind of tiered thing. So if you're buying more different packages, you actually can save more. Sometimes you'll save a little bit less, but they're changing it to make sure that the people who want to get on the mushies to get the reishi and the lion's mane and all these incredible things. They're mushroom coffees and mushroom hot cocos to be able to get greater discounts depending on what you get. So uh, pop over there, check them out. It's F-O-U-R-S-I-G-M-A-T-I-C dot com forward slash model. 15% off. Pop over there, check them out. And now let's get back to our compilation of seven scary good reminders of how powerful you are to affect change in your life. And next up, we've got a message from best-selling author, fitness world champion, Lori Harder, all right? Lori has just had an incredible impact on the fitness domain, but also helping folks to kind of parlay that into more powerful messages, you know, as entrepreneurs and creating their own making their own mark on the world. Like she's been very giving in what she's learned over the years and all the struggles and challenges that she's gone through, not really seeing people doing the things that she's done. So we had a great conversation and Lori's going to share with you why it's important for you to decide what 
this time in human history and this time in your life really means for you. So let's jump into this conversation with the incredible Lori Harder. I love this idea because I think it's the most powerful idea that we can attach into to create a life that we enjoy or that we love or especially of purpose. Um, Because there are going to be terrible things that happen in our lives. No matter what, we cannot escape them. It's the human experience. It's literally why we're here is because we're going to experience all of it. And I think that we can live into staying in resistance and being really afraid of it, or we can understand that they're going to happen and accept it as much as possible, um, and create a meaning from it. There's always, there's hundreds of different meanings we can create, but amongst those hundreds of different meetings, you're going to get probably two that are going to stand out for you. And you always have to ask what is the most empowering powerful meaning that I can create from this thing that has happened that I can now turn into some form of purpose moving forward because the way to attach power to anything that's been really painful or horrible or torturous or whatever it is is to see how you can help someone attach a meaning to it so that you could help somebody who is in it or is going through it or could potentially in the future go through it. And what that's going to do is help you move through, obviously, really powerfully. And you're, you're not going to be stuck in that thought or that thing or that event anymore when you start to attach a powerful meaning to it. Yeah. Reverend Rohr, he says, if you don't learn how to transform your pain, you'll transfer it to the people that you love. Mm. And wow. that, to me, is exactly that. It's about how, if you're feeling pain, how do you learn how to attach a meaning to why you have that pain and turn it into a purpose. Because the most successful, most amazing, most impactful people who are doing incredible things in the world, majority of them that I've gotten the opportunity to speak to, and I know that you know this too from your podcast, is because they had something painful happen and they gave it a meaning to help other people. All right, that was the incredible Lori Harder. And again, you get to choose what all of this means for you. This very complex time in human history where a lot of new things are taking place, where there's a lot of changes, you get to decide, you get to choose what all of this means for you. And another important takeaway from Lori's conversation is that your growth and success through all of this isn't just about you. It's also about how you can help others. And so by you going through these different situations and figuring things out, you can pay that forward. You can share what you've learned, your insights, your experience with other people. And so if you were to give advice to someone right now who's in a similar place or familiar situation as you, what advice would you give them? What advice would you give someone who's having a tough time right now to find some peace of mind? What advice would you give them? And just by you thinking about how can I help somebody else with it, we teach what we want to learn. And so that might bring up some things that are valuable for you to employ if you haven't done so already. So what advice would you give to somebody who's in a similar situation? What advice would you give someone who is focused on all that negativity going on in the world right now to find new hope in the midst of all of it? What advice would you give someone who's, who's trying to find hope right now? So these are all things that we, we're doing not just for ourselves, but we're doing for others. And so it's going to lead me to our next clip of these seven scary good messages and reminders of how powerful you are to affect change. And man, this next one, this guy, ah, oh, he has affected some change in his life and in the world in an incredible way. He's a best-selling author, one of the top speakers on the planet. He's the founder of Fit Body Boot Camp. They have Before I even tell you about Fit Body Bootcamp, what they've achieved, please know that my really good friend, Bedros Koulian, he immigrated from a very difficult, warring situation with his family when he was just a child. And he grew up in like really massive poverty and, you know, spent time, his entire family sleeping in a tiny room, uh, having experiences even as he, you know, grew older into an adult, it's like, you know, sleeping in his truck all these situations, but 
changing his environment, getting more powerful messages, getting himself around more opportunity and people who are thinking differently really helped to catapult him to a different place. So coming from where, he, where he's come from as a struggling uh, entrepreneur who you know got into the fitness domain, but then he had his side jobs. He was a bouncer and he was a fry cook, I think at Disneyland or Disney World, one of the two, all right? So he's going to the club, you know, trying to keep it kosher with everybody, smelling like fish grease. And then he's got clients to train, trying to make it all work. Today, as a CEO and founder of Fit Body Bootcamp, they've got about 700 locations. What? This is the power that we all have. This is the power of the human mind. This is the power we have to affect change in our lives and the lives of the entire world. So in this clip, he's going to be talking about how many of us have a psychological emergency brake pulled that's preventing us from achieving what we're capable of. So let's check out what my friend, the incredible Bedros Koulian has to say about it. Sean, imagine if outside of this building, your studio here, I park a brand new Ferrari 599. Um, but unbeknownst to you, I've got the emergency brake slightly pulled up, mm -hmm. but I give you the keys. I go, there you go, Sean, enjoy it. And you're driving this thing, and you go, this is not driving how I would think a Ferrari would drive. It seems sluggish, it's not, the performance isn't there. Well, the reality is that the emergency brake has been slightly pulled up, right? And so the car's not performing to its fullest potential. Even though it's a Ferrari, even though it's got premium gasoline, even though the engine is in great shape, it's not performing. The moment you figure out that you have to drop that e-brake, the car all of a sudden becomes the Ferrari that we all know and love, and, yeah. and holy cow, it's flying, and it's cutting corners, and it's defying gravity. Well, in life, we have many limiting beliefs, and this comes from, remember, when we're born, it's our parents' job and the tribe's job, if you will, to guide us. Hey, don't touch that, don't do that, you're gonna burn yourself, be safe, don't take that risk, you know, not too loud. Hey, you're supposed to be seen and not heard, right? And really the way I look at it is someone else is holding, especially in the first 20 years of your life, someone else is holding the pen and writing the narrative in your book, right? That's, what, that's how I visualize it. I'm a very visual person. Yeah. And to me, that's them pulling the e-brake up, saying how Sean should be, how Bedro should be. And so we spend the next 20 years going, well, there's a game plan that someone wrote for me. Maybe this is, I should try and how I should operate. And so those are our limiting beliefs. You know, I'm, I'm a foreigner, I'm an immigrant, and because of that, I'm blue collar. And because of that, I'll never be successful because I'm not educated and I didn't go to college and I'm not white collar. And so that was my narrative. My dad <clears throat> would walk around the house when we came to America, God bless him, he had three, four jobs at any given time to make ends meet. But he would, one of his sayings were, we always tend to run out of money before we run out of month. Like if you're always running out of money, yeah. and that became a loop, and that became a limiting belief that mm -hmm. in my family, basically me, we will always run out of money before we run out of month. So because of that, I made sure to make that narrative come true yeah. through the actions, because your belief systems, whether they're limiting or not, or limitless, your belief systems determine your habits, your habits determine your actions, your actions determine your outcome, right? Yeah. And so, it's usually when we figure out in the next 20 years that, oh, you know what, someone else had the pen and they were writing my narrative for me and they were creating these limiting beliefs, effectively pulling my emergency break up. And we spend our next 20 years after that from 40 on, like for me, 38 was that critical point of realizing, wait, I'm a pretty intelligent guy. I can see trends before they're coming. People hire me and pay me an obscene amount of money. It's just, I looked at it as I'm, I got a lucky break. Like I, I, I can figure out something in, in Sean's business that he can't, so he's gonna pay me money to tell him that and help him create a faster outcome. When in reality, I have a gift, yeah. and I realize that now. Yeah. But I thought, oh, I was lucky. I could just see something in your business that you couldn't, right? Mm -hmm. I would always downplay my gift. Yeah. And so that was a limiting belief I had. And so as we put the e-brakes down, we see that life moves better, faster, with less friction, and there's yeah. a tremendous amount of happiness. All right, that was the incredible Bedros Koulian. And I just wanna reiterate this point and ask you, who might you be handing the pen over to to write the story of your life? Who might you be passing that over to right now? Is it friends and family who don't support your vision? Are you passing that over to the media to write your story for you? Are you passing it over to the winner of the presidential election 
to write that story for you? Who are you unconsciously handing that responsibility over to? That's influencing so heavily your story when the pen is in your hand. Take back control. Take back that pen. Who are you allowing to pull up the emergency brake in your car? They're trying to hit. They're trying to do the Tokyo Drift with your life. Who are you allowing to do that? You have everything that you need right now to get to where you want to go. But we need to understand that when we're allowing things outside of ourselves to limit us in our perception and to control and determine things that we do, that's the very definition of giving our power away. And for our final message today, we've got somebody to truly remind you of how powerful you are. And this is a conversation I had with Dr. Joe Dispenza. And this really speaks for itself. Dr. Joe Dispenza is a world-renowned uh, physician, practitioner, teacher, and best-selling author of many books. And his influence, just about more so than anybody that I know, I receive more messages and see more people just that I meet friends and family who've had access to Joe's work and who will tell me more so than anybody how much Joe has changed their life. So he's got something special. He knows a thing or 20. And this message here that you're about to uh, get access to is one of the most important reminders of this entire episode. So truly listen in, listen deeply, take this to heart and check out this message from Dr. Joe Dispenza. The story we tell ourselves is how we perceive the world. And so then, then when we create the difficulties in our life, it reaffirms the belief that life is hard, that it's really someone out there that's doing it to us, that it's the circumstance in the past that created this. Okay, let's take away the person that did it. Let's shoot them to the moon. Let's, uh, let's erase your past. Now, now what are you going to do now? Like, you still, you still got to do something, right? You're still alive. And I say we already know how to do this. We already know how to do this. We're wired to be creators. We're wired to do this. The thing that stops us, for the most part, in doing it is really the hormones of stress, because living in stress constantly is living in survival. And living in survival is living in emergency. In an emergency, it's not a time to create. Mm. In an emergency, it's not a time to open your heart. It's not a time to learn. It's not even a time to sit still. So most people then that are living in stress and living in survival, they can't believe in a future yet because it's not a time to create. So getting people to that point where they make up their mind and they make up their mind enough to begin to think there's got to be a better way. There's got to be something else. That awakening process typically happens when people reach their lowest denominator. They hit rock bottom because then they can see themselves through the eyes of somebody else. You're, you're, you feel so altered, you're not returning any texts. You feel so altered, you don't want to go to dinner with your buddies. You feel so altered, you know, you don't want to watch your favorite TV show. You're just, you're just disconnected. And that's when you start observing yourself. But my message is, why wait for that? I mean, you can learn and change in pain and suffering, or you can learn and change in joy and inspiration. If you're waking up every morning being defined by a vision of the future instead of the memories of the past, and you get up and you're inspired from an elevated self now, instead of a limited self, you could observe the old self from an elevated state instead of that diminished state, and people are doing that. So they are aware of those thoughts. And yes, it takes uh, effort, and if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Mm. But just because you have a thought doesn't necessarily mean it's true. And when you start looking and observing those thoughts, um, I think you are like Gandalf, because Gandalf also said, you know, you may not pass, mm. you know, when he meant like that kind of severity when it comes to how we, we make up our mind about things. That's the kind of energy or intention that begins to create the biggest volume of change in our life. And I've interviewed thousands of people in our work that have healed from really serious health conditions. And I would say about 90% of them when I asked them, so what happened? The first thing they say all the time is, I just made up my mind. I just made up my mind I was going to do this. Yeah. And they made a decision with such firm intention that the amplitude of that decision 
carried a level of energy that was greater than the hardwired programs in their brain and the emotional conditioning in their body. And the choice that they made caused their body to respond to a new mind. In fact, the choice they made became a moment that they would never forget. It was an event. And the stronger the emotion they felt, the more they paid attention to the choice. And in a sense, they were remembering their future. And the body emotionally was getting a sampling, a taste of the future. And they're aligned to that future. And that's when the body's healing began. That's when the miracle started, right in that moment. That's how powerful we really are. Now, what if you did that every day? What if you made up your mind every single day you weren't going to get up from your meditation until you were that person you wanted to be? Game on now. Because mm. you'd have to do battle with all the things that are not consistent with it. And that's exactly how our brain works. So then, if you want to be wealthy, you can't feel lack. You want to be a master. You can't judge your coworker. You want to be like, somebody great in history, then you better execute peace in every area of your life. That's, that's the law. So you take the prayer out on the road now. You take the prayer, you're the living example of the prayer. That's where, that's where it matters the most. And that's when people start getting suspicious and say, Sean, man, did you change your medication? I mean, you're looking way too happy all of a sudden. <laughs> well, you're not relying on anything outside of you to bring you joy. You're, you're, you're overcoming yourself every day. And people say to me, well, why do you do your meditations in the morning? I always say, easy. Because if I can overcome myself at the beginning of the day, the rest of the day is easy. Because right. that's, that's the biggest mastery, Absolutely. right, is the self. So people are waking up to that, and you know they, they enjoy the process of seeing when they make those type of changes, the feedback that's happening in their lives, you know, yeah. the synchronicities, yeah. the opportunities, the coincidences, you know, those serendipities that are starting to happen, and they're going, "Wow, I am powerful. Yeah. Hey, I am a creator." And nobody's excluded from the equation. That's what makes it so cool. We're not doomed by our genes. We're not hardwired to be a certain way for the rest of our lives. We are marvels of adaptability and change. So then what does it mean to change? Change means then to be greater than your body, greater than the body that has been conditioned emotionally to be the mind, greater than the body habituated into a predictable future, to be greater than the environment, to be greater than the conditions in your life. And if you're not being defined by a vision of the future and you wake up every morning, it makes total sense then when you see the same people and you go to the same places and you do the exact same thing at the exact same time, now your personality is no longer creating your personal reality. Your personal reality is creating your personality mm. because every person, every object, every thing, every place is mapped neurologically in your brain. And since you've experienced your boss, since you've experienced your coworker, since you've experienced your ex, the moment you've experienced them at some point, there's an emotion associated with them. So then all of a sudden people wake up and they're not aware of this, but their environment is influencing the way they think and the way they feel. So when things are going good, they feel good. When things are bad, they feel bad, which means they're victims to their environment. Why are you unhappy? Well, this person made me unhappy, which means unconsciously, that person is actually controlling the way I feel and the way I think. Now I'm a victim to that circumstance. So to change then is to be greater than that environment. So then you would have to reprogram the way you'd think and the way you'd feel to no longer return back to the same state of being. Now that's, that's the mastery, because it isn't just having a great meditation and then getting on the freeway and flipping everybody off or judging <laughs> your coworker. Right. You just return back to the old self. You gotta be able to maintain that modified state of mind and body your entire day. And if you can, get ready, because weird things are gonna happen in your life. So the person who's starting to try it out in a curious way, Let's just do the experiment. Let's just see if I change my energy, I change the way I think I feel and feel. Is there going to be some effect in my life? When they start seeing that, they're no longer like, oh, I got to go create my, you know, my life today. They're actually excited to do it because they don't want the magic to end. They want to keep it going. Now, that's when it gets kind of cool because this is when you start believing in yourself. And when you believe in yourself, you believe in possibilities, right? When you believe in possibilities, you gotta believe in yourself. When you stop believing in possibilities, you can't believe in yourself. So people are waking up and going, wow, it doesn't matter your skin color, it doesn't matter how rich you are, it doesn't matter how healthy you are, it doesn't matter how young you are, how old you are, how in shape, out of shape. Not, 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 even, not even if you've ever meditated before, it doesn't even matter. It's a formula. And you don't need 40 years 
of dedication to meditation to get it. You just got to understand the formula. And like playing ping pong or hitting a golf ball or dancing the salsa, you're going to figure it out sooner or later, and it's going to get easier and it's going to get fun. That's what we want for people. That's what we want for you. That's Dr. Joe Dispenza, and this message is so important right now. And just a really powerful reminder that there is so much potential in you. It's always been there. It's there right now and it will always be there. But it's up to us and it is your time to take control of it. And there is nothing, again, just to remind you, there is nothing outside of you that can control your destiny unless you give it silent permission to. So right now is the time to take control. Take control full responsibility for writing your story. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world of effects around us. We can affect the world of effects, but we need to be empowered within our own lives. And so I hope that you enjoyed this message today. And if you did, please share it out with the people that you care about. And you can share right from the podcast app. You can share on social media. But this is an important message right now when there's so much influx, there's a lot of uncertainty. And any of us, even the very best of us, can use a reminder from time to time. So I appreciate you so much, truly, for tuning into the show today. We've got some epic shows coming your way very soon. Take care, have an amazing day, and I'll talk with you soon. Isolation is really bad for your brain. And so, you know, now we have tools. We can FaceTime, we can Skype, we can Zoom, we can text, we can be connected.